Okay, well, I think, should, should we make a start? Okay. Welcome to all of those who have uh, kindly joined this session. I think we've got 9, 10, and it's increasing as, I, as we go on. We'll see if we can get the ratings up and get more, more people to join us as we go through when no doubt, um, they'll hear about it. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Ed Cross. I'm a disputes partner at Simmons & Simmons. Uh, a lot of my work is litigation and obviously international arbitration, and I do a lot of CIS-related disputes as do everyone on this panel, as you would expect. Um, my particular interest in this uh, session today is that I had the misfortune of being involved in a five-week arbitration hearing over the entire summer period, cancelling all holidays, because it had been adjourned from April early in the year when the pandemic really took force in the UK. Um, but what it did is it did give me a bit of an insight of, of how a fully remote hearing involving 21 witnesses, experts, simultaneous translation, how that works in practice. And uh, it was a real eye opener. And I have to say it was a success uh, in terms of, you know, can it work and does it work? Absolutely. And we want to share some experiences of that and also get your experiences and insight as well. Aksana Wright is from Fox uh, Rothschild in New York. She's going to give us a, a bit of a US perspective as well and also international arbitration. Um, Aksana has extensive experience in uh, CIS related disputes. She's fluent in Russian. She studied in St. Petersburg and for a period, I think, worked in Salins in St. Petersburg as well. <laughs> Alexei is also uh, fluent in Russian, as his name suggests. Uh, he is a disputes counsel at Freshfields uh, in Moscow, specializing in arbitration, uh, court proceedings, international, uh, sorry, internal investigations and sanctions. And Alexei has participated in the development of some of the Russians uh, new uh, arbitration legislation adopted in 2000. And 15, and you'll know Alexei well because he's a veteran of the ABA, and I've had the pleasure of speaking alongside him um, on previous occasions. So, just a little bit of context for this uh, session. Pre-COVID, the, the number of times I think that we had telephone hearings or video hearings was fairly rare. In, in in general, parties and the tribunal would default to in-person hearings, not least because it gives you an opportunity to travel abroad very often. Uh, the tribunal like to do that. Um, then came COVID. Uh, after the initial shock and, and adjournment of some hearings, people started to realize it was possible to do a fully remote hearing. But there were some initial challenges and uh, a lot of uh, people were reinventing the wheel in, in terms of identifying how exactly do you do it? Does it work? And we want to explore some of those challenges today and also hear from all of you as to what your experience has been. And that's very important um, that we get that wider perspective because we have a very international um, uh, audience um, throughout all of these sessions. Uh, but I think we want to examine, if we can imagine a post COVID world, what will it be like? Will courts and tribunals go back to their old ways of having in-person hearings? Or has the experience of remote hearings been such that actually this is something that will become the, the new norm, the default potentially. And if it is that, what are the pros and cons? What are you giving up by having a virtual discussion as we're having uh, today? So I want to get uh, the thoughts of our panel. And as I say, I also want to get your thoughts. I would encourage you to raise that electronic hand if you want to say something, or, or frankly, um, if you're permitted to do so. And Oksana, you can, you can give people the, the permissions, I think, to do this just pop up with your video camera and, uh, and intervene because I want this to be as interactive as this forum uh, allows. But starting first, uh, just with sort of general views, if I may, Alexei, on um, remote hearings, what's your experience and your firm's experience been of remote hearings? Do you think they're here to stay, what, what positive or negative? I think uh, <clears throat> it's, uh probably an uh, inevitable evil uh, in the in the short period uh, during the COVID. Uh, so we, as a firm, we had uh, a number, a number of those hearings, not, not that many, actually. Uh, I think uh, generally the trend was to try and postpone mostly, but some, some of those couldn't be postponed uh, without some prejudice to the parties. So they had to proceed on, on the virtual basis and uh, uh, it was manageable, it was fine. Um, in the meaning, of course, it's, uh, it, it's 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 not uh, it's, it, it it could not it could it could never replicate a full physical hearing with uh, um, all the body language all, uh, all the reading into the demeanor of the of the, of the witnesses uh, 
all this chemistry and all this uh, human contact, uh, we still it's still uh, probably from our perspective the norm and uh, the preferable way of doing at least com complicated and uh, major uh, important cases which we normally tend to have. Uh, but maybe there is uh, going forward maybe there will be room for like more room for virtual hearings for smaller scale disputes. That's that's basically the gist of our takeaway. But other than that. Uh, where we had to, uh, so it, 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 it really wasn't desirable, but uh, where we had to, we had those hearings and uh, there are lots of issues and we will, I think, discuss them, but in our experience, all of this is workable, all can be overcome. So we, yeah. uh, nothing fatal. That's, that's the reaction of clients to, you know, doing commercial cases at a high level. Uh, well, at a high level, uh, we, uh, I think we did not have any strong preference like or strong push from clients to f for the virtual hearings. So it was uh, more like a necessity uh, at, uh, at the moment, at the, uh, the necessity of the situation. Although uh, Russian clients and well, it's, it's, it's not something special to Russian clients, but of course, a lot of clients are uh, very cost sensitive. Uh, and uh, even before the pandemic, we had lots of interests from clients in things like how you do cheap, how you do arbitration cheaply, uh, how how you cut the costs. Uh, would you uh, would you recommend, uh, uh, for example, using one arbitrator instead of three, uh, using some other techniques? Uh, would you um, recommend document only procedure? Things like that. So I think in in uh, uh, in a way, the virtual hearings are just one more tool. Uh, which will definitely uh, be of interest to this group of clients who are interested in uh, cost cutting. And by the way, those uh, sometimes those are very uh, serious major companies because, for example, um, Russian I don't know, Russian metallurgy companies. They yes, they do have uh, 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 some very very high profile, high um, value disputes. But in reality, most of the uh, of the disputes which arise for them are for very small uh, amounts, like for routine supply of, of goods uh, um, uh, to Europe. So uh, it's so even to them, it's uh, to an extent that's a solution that's something useful to have those virtual hearings. But uh, I I wouldn't call it as a as a mainstream or something which Freshfields firm strongly advocates. Yeah. How about you, Aksana? What do you think? What's your experience been? Thanks, Seth. Yeah, as you mentioned pre-COVID, there was some kind of limited use of remote or virtual technology, for example, like at least here in the United States, you know, the preliminary conferences or case management conference were, would often be conducted um, virtually by phone or emergency hearings or a witness that is located abroad. That's a very common practice to have that witness testify with, over the video, to be deposed over the video. It's, you know, always great to have a 3 a.m. deposition with, you know, witness in Hong Kong. Uh, but again, the full-blown trials were in person. And here we are, you know, post-COVID. And I think the initial reaction was, okay, all the proceedings that can't wait, we'll try to do it virtually and everything else, let's adjourn. And then I think, I think in the beginning, everybody thought it's kind of a temporary thing, you know, COVID will go away and here we are back to normalcy. And as we've realized that, you know, we're here for the long haul, it became more common. And as I think uh, clients and practitioners became more familiar and did more and more of those proceedings, um, it's still probably not the status quo. Although it is the status quo right now, I think 99.9% uh, of my hearings in courts and in arbitration are virtual. But um, I think the clients and the practitioners are getting more comfortable and realizing there are certain benefits about the virtual proceedings. And at least I think for the near future, it's going to be a norm, um, you know, after maybe we have a vaccine or, you know, COVID is not an issue. I think there will be still some mix of virtual, you know, certain proceedings you probably can't really conduct virtual, like a jury trial, you know, it's jury trial. How can you have it virtually? But I think everybody's getting more and more comfortable. But that said, 
Every time I have a virtual proceeding without a fail, there is a judge or an arbitrator or a client or a counsel who says, I absolutely hate this. I can't go, I can't wait to go back to in person. So not everyone buys that just yet. Well, according to Trump, we'll probably, you, 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 you'll have your vaccine fairly soon and you can go back and, you know, to in person and possibly same for you, Alexia, you know. Well, but, apparently in Russia, they've already got it. So. <laughs> that's right won't comment on that on that any further the um what about alexi i mean any practical reasons why in-person hearings are preferable as Aksana mentioned that some do prefer it okay i think uh, it's uh, it's uh, very obvious uh, uh, it's, it's it's human business this uh, this chemistry and this person contact means a lot and uh, First of all, for you, for you as an advocate, as as, as party counsel, you want to to really uh, uh, be persuasive. You you really need to make sure that your points are being understood and uh, that you uh, state your case to the maximum. Basically, that you and uh, you, it's well, it's it's possible to do this also in virtual uh, in the uh, in a virtual framework. But you know, there are there are there are uh, there may be uh, some nuances which uh, may, may hurt the case. If, uh, for example, if you are not sure that uh, you have the full uh, tribunal attention uh, or there are some technical issues which really affect how testimony is being given, uh, all of these things uh, uh, ultimately they, they, they can matter. Uh, and um, in, in our experience, in my experience, uh, when, uh, when everyone is personally uh, present when you can uh, uh, see the body language, when you see what basically you can sense what's happening and whether you are being understood. That's that, that, that makes a lot of difference for for counsel, for for tribunal as well. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, well maybe that's the new norm or it will become the new norm. But uh, typically, uh, uh, some contact. It, it well may be that uh, um, uh, the hearing is the first time that the, the tribunal really uh, meets together. And it's uh, also an invaluable um, um, uh, chance for them to, to really start discussing the case, to, to really again get this human uh, human sense of uh, what's happening, uh, uh, who, who is lying, who's telling the truth, what's, uh, what's, what this case is really about. Uh, so again, uh, this can be uh, replicated to some extent in, 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 in a virtual hearing. Uh, it, it may work out well, but um, yes, something may be lost, even, even for the for the uh, arbitrators, because uh, really it's it's a novel. Uh, well, for most of us, it's a novel, uh, untested experience, uh, which may be almost as good as a, as a as a physical hearing, but still, it's not the same. No, I mean that body language thing is really important, isn't it? If you think, for most people, if they're not that used to, if you haven't got the setup right and they're being taken to documents or they're looking at different members of the tribunal, their eyes are going dotting all over the place. Now that can be interpreted as being evasive or shifty. And similarly, if you're an advocate and your tribunal are scribbling away like this and not engaging with you in, in perhaps in the way that they would do if you were in an in-person hearing, you can't judge what the advocate's thinking about your submissions. So there's, I think the body language I've, I've certainly heard is a really big factor and quite how you get around that. I think there are some practical things we did, which maybe we'll, we'll, we'll come on to later in terms of physical setup at the screen. But, um, Aksana, I heard it said at one previous conference on this topic that, that hearings tend to go shorter, that they actually seem to be a little bit more efficient and quick. quick. Is that, have you seen that or is it, can you think why that might be? Yeah, I've noticed that as well, and I think there are several reasons, and some are good, and some probably not as good, and first of all, I think remote hearings is still a relatively novel issue for many, so parties tend to prepare better and prepare more for the hearing, so it goes both smooth, um, I've noticed that. Uh, at the same time, there's less intervention by the tribunal. You know, it's harder to interrupt advocates when they're on the video and the tribunal might be not as, as engaged as in person. So that's probably um, kind of the negative side of that. At the same time, there's also less intervention by um, the council. So there's less talking over each other. Talking over each other, especially 
over the video is really not efficient, especially if there are several different languages involved. So just, you know, create some math. Um, and, you know, probably I think the most practical reason why hearings are shorter, it's really hard to sit in front of the computer the whole day, you know, in front of the screen. At least when you have in-person hearing, you can kind of take a break, you can go for a walk with your client, you can grab a lunch with your team. Here, even the breaks are done over the, over the computer, over the phone, you know, in the breakout rooms or over WhatsApp when you're talking to the client. So practically speaking, it's really hard to go with a virtual hearing uh, for more than half a day. And I certainly would not recommend that. No, I, I've really heard that in lots of different contexts. Um, there was a seven week trial in London and the advocate there said it was exhausting, absolutely exhausting. You know, because as you say, you, you have your breaks and that's when you're supposed to go make a cup of tea or a coffee, or, but you're not, you're straight on to meeting with the clients as you need to, to get, you know, get instructions. So there's no escape there. And I think that, Ours was a full day, but you could see that everybody was getting very tired towards the end of it. Um, Alexa, you mentioned about costs and clients being very cost conscious. Uh, do you think there are overall savings with doing a remote hearing? Uh, well, I don't have any uh, hard numbers, but I think yes. Uh, it, uh, normally, that that would uh, uh, that's uh, that's a method of cost saving because, of course, you don't have travel, you don't uh, have police. Uh, offices, uh, uh, rooms, uh, uh, so that's, um, uh, there is a lot to be saved. Uh, on the other hand, of course, this, uh, this uh, method uh, will, uh, may, may necessitate some additional costs. Like, for example, you, you will need electronic hearing bundles, most likely, and uh, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, not cheap. But uh, overall, and again, not, not having any precise numbers with me, I think uh, it's, uh, it's uh, possible to, to save a lot. On, yeah. the hearing, on the hearing itself, of course, then uh, it's, uh, you have this uh, um, uh, classical problem of uh, clients trying to save costs, but really the main, the main element, of course, is, is really a, a lawyer's time, yeah. uh, which, we, which uh, may, may actually increase with this, uh, like, because of, for all of those reasons uh, we, which we just uh, discussed. But yes. I mean, the, 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 just the, uh, the costs, uh, Rather than than uh, than legal costs, yes, they they may be saved. Yeah, yeah. Should we have a poll question, Oksana? Can you do you want to try the technology and see whether this works? Yeah. 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 All right, there you go. Can you see that? Okay. What does it say? So should remote should hearing remote hearings become the default setting for case management hearings at least up to half a day? Okay, well, from a statistical perspective, I'm not sure this one will, will survive because we've only had two people vote. Oh, hang on, here we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we've also got a question. Yes. From the audience. Yeah. So that's that interesting. That figure there is quite similar to, to the other conference I had, you know, strongly in favor of CMC type hearings being done remotely. Okay, that's interesting. And sorry, you said that, Alexander, there's a question. Yeah, we have a question uh, from uh, Raman Zhukov. Does the right to physical hearing exist in international arbitration at all? Oh, that's one for Alexei. <laughs> Why me? <laughs> because I was going to ask it to you later and it's in your script. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it's, uh, we can uh, actually, we, uh, maybe it's a good time to discuss it. Actually, it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant question and it's not, easy, not an easy one. Uh, because uh, uh, under the laws of, um, of many jurisdictions, uh, the, the right to a hearing is presumed. And uh, that's also the case uh, for uh, many uh, leading arbitration rules, where uh, the parties uh, would, uh, um, especially when at least one party uh, um, uh, demands or requires a hearing, there, there will be a, a hearing. That's, like, that's the norm. The question is then what uh, what uh, the hearing is. Does it mean a physical hearing? That's uh, that's a very interesting uh, question because uh, actually uh, uh, I just looked at uh, uh, in preparation to this uh, webinar. I looked at the major rules. In reality, uh, uh, almost well, the majority of rules do not uh, do not provide specifically and explicitly whether a video uh, he uh, video hearings are. 
uh, permitted or, or prohibited. Um, there, there, are, there are some exception, exceptions. For example, the LCI rules are a notable exception. Uh, there is a clause that uh, the tribunal uh, will decide on the form of a hearing, including uh, possibly by a, a video hearing. So that's, that's settled for, for the LCIA. Uh, uh, there are also some explicit provisions uh, for uh, possible video hearings um, uh, in the in the Russian arbitration rules uh, in the Russian for the Russian arbitration center uh, or uh, the rules uh, of the uh, of the ICAC, uh, Russia's uh, main arbitral institution. The, uh, there is a there is a, a explicit provision about the possibility of uh, a video conf uh, conference uh, merits hearing. Uh, in other rules, for example, in the ICC rules, there are uh, some. In some specific situations, uh, the video hearings are endorsed. For example, uh, for uh, many, uh, for the uh, uh, procedural uh, conferences, uh, or uh, there is a, uh, there are mentioned uh, in respect of uh, uh, expedited proceedings, uh, emergency proceedings. So there are some things for which uh, the the matter is settled. So yes, well, you can have the. the, the um, that the rules will be amended where, where they, they don't provide for this. Certainly the English High Court issued a, a practice direction pretty quickly saying this is, this is, you can do this and this is how it's going to work. And if yeah, they don't, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll light on business, I guess. Yeah, and by the way, um, uh, all, um, just to, 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 um, uh, to, to finish the ICC um, um, uh, part. Uh, actually, the, 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 the interesting question in respect of the ICC rules is that there is a provision, it's clause 25.2 of the rules, which uh, says that uh, by default, after uh, hearing uh, the, um, um, after hearing the evidence, uh, the court will have a meeting uh, or hearing uh, with the parties. And then again, it's only in the English version of the, uh, of the rules, it's not, uh, not present in the uh, other uh, la uh, language uh, versions of the ICC rules, but the English, well, it seems to say that, uh, seems to imply that it, it must be a physical hearing. But even that is not certain because definitely the ICC itself and others, uh, they, uh, other arbitral institutions, they really endorse virtual hearings now. The ICC uh, issued a very useful guidance where they uh, just uh, plainly say that they don't read uh, this uh, provision in a restrictive way. They, uh, the virtual hearings are, as, basically, they are a full replacement for an ordinary hearing. So I, uh, just uh, the bottom line, I think, is that um, I, uh, there, are, there are probably no, uh, at least no direct obstacles to virtual hearings in, in any of the leading rules uh, or in any of the uh, leading arbitration laws. Um, however, uh, it's... Um, well, especially because we are now uh, in, a, uh, in the context of uh, Russian and CIS disputes and the Russian parties, they, like the, 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 the first thing they uh, like to do when they lose a case uh, is uh, try to uh, throw up some, some um, well, some uh, good or just crazy uh, arguments to uh, try to set aside or, to, uh, or especially to uh, uh, object to the enforcement in Russia. And uh, uh, while on the face of it, it, uh, it, it seems there are no real obstacles and uh, no prohibition uh, of those virtual hearings, it's still possible to conceive a Russian party arguing before a Russian court that, uh, uh, for example, if they had an uh, ICC arbitration, that in reality everybody misinterprets the rules, in reality uh, the yes. rules did not provide uh, for, uh, for such a form of a hearing. And, uh, uh, with that through, through by contract through an arbitration clause because you've mentioned something to me about this uh well it's it's um it's uh well it's a yes and no uh, uh answer so uh, you can you can try to uh, mitigate your risk by uh, just saying plainly in your uh, arbitration clause uh that uh virtual hearings are permitted or i have even seen in, uh, well it's it's I would say it's not uh, the mainstream so far. I haven't seen many of those arbitration cl uh, clauses. Mainly people just use the standard clauses, which says say nothing about virtual hearings, because uh, under all of those rules, there is no prohibition on such hearings, uh, and there is always a very wide discretion 
uh, with the tribunal to decide on, uh, on basically on all matters, including the form of a hearing, and people just rely on that. But I have seen some where people just uh, wrote in their clause specifically that virtual hearings are permitted. In one case, I even saw that people uh, drafted in um, the limitation on physical hearings. Actually, they said that uh, hearings must be, uh, um, as, as a default, they must be virtual unless the, the tribunal finds some good grounds that it could, could also be uh, physical. Again, um, depending on your situation, you might uh, uh, try to do that. I wouldn't say that that's strictly necessary. And uh, I think um, uh, we, we really don't see this as a, as a mainstream uh, in, the, in negotiations over those clauses. So not many parties do this. What are the, uh, Exana, thank you. Um, what, what, are the, Exana, what are the challenges that you see in trying to agree to, to have a remote hearing or, or if you want to default to an in-person hearing, whether it be practical or legal? Do you yeah. think? Right, as we as we just mentioned, you know, first of all, I would really check the rules, uh, the tribunals, the arbitration forums rules, and I would certainly feel more comfortable agreeing to a virtual hearing, uh, you know, an LCIA because they went out of their way. Right now, uh, there's a new Article 19.2 which specifically says for virtual hearings are permitted, and then I think if um, if I put the detail, you, you don't need to put like the the exact details, but you should at least agree on, you know, what part of the virtual hearings, um, what part of the hearings can proceed virtually, or um, some major details. You should probably agree on that, you know, whether it's the whole hearing, with, whether it's just the parts of them, you know, how it's supposed to be done, under what circumstances, you know, maybe if there are travel restrictions, for example, but I think some of the parameters should be worked out. Otherwise, you know, it will just create more disputes. I think you, you, you do need to get a protocol in place. We, we had quite a detailed protocol about how things were going to work, when documents were going to be uploaded, you know, whether it was going to be recorded, you know, because there were some concerns about that from a sort of confidentiality perspective even though you get a, a live transcript. Just picking up on um, uh, a comment from Anna Karad, who's um, an interpreter, of just how exhausting it is from, from, from an, an interpreter's perspective of trying to do simultaneous translation. And also I think for the transcribers, it's, it's very much harder. Um, but uh, I have a lot of sympathy with that. We certainly we've had that feedback regularly and very fairly so in, in, in our case. See if there are any other questions before we move on to our next topic. And yes, sure. this is our next topic, which is you know during the hearings work for trials, and as you mentioned, you just completed your five week trial, um, full remote trial with LCIE, and if you don't mind sharing your experience and how it was different with in person hearings, and how did you handle specific concerns like. Yeah. Or it's your witness covering or, you know, all the other issues that come up in remote hearings. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, on our case, we, the UK went into lockdown literally a week before the case was about to start and, and that led to an adjournment application. I think in, in reality, we probably would have struggled to get the IT side of it set up as well as we did three months later. Unfortunately, the tribunal had could, could accommodate that. But all the questions go through your head, you know, will the technology work? What platforms do you use? There were announcements about Zoom being not secure. We, in fact, I think they've addressed that. Uh, and the concerns about witness demeanor, that was a big one for us, Alexia in particular. Um, how can you do simultaneous translations? Yes, you can now through, through Zoom. There's two audio um, feeds and you can select it at the bottom. It says English actually has a US sign, which slightly annoyed all the English QCs. Um, or, um, or, or Russian, so that, and that worked really well. Um, the things that struggled were user problems, as you mentioned, Aksana, about people's not having sufficient broadband, but what we found is three months later, everyone had you know, caught fiber octave or had made sure they were in a venue where it would work properly. We actually put all of our witnesses, we did get our witnesses to come into our office in London and we hosted those there because we just felt trying to do it remotely from people's homes or elsewhere was, was going to create um, huge problems. In terms of documentation and getting that up on screen for those who haven't gone through this process, 
it's it's as good i think you know you um we had ours administered by the idrc using opus 2 which is the um, um uh, live transcription um electronic bundles and what happened is when a trial document was shown it would come up on a second screen and you'd have the english and you'd have the russian on the same screen and you also had something which was quite cheeky really as the advocates could suddenly say well i'm going to share my screen and suddenly you'd be on a google page where they're entering in a search to against something relevant to the case um not very fair on the witnesses because of course it's something entirely new but but that flexibility was there or even showing a video at the start to demonstrate that the witness on the other side actually did speak fluent english the person was being interviewed on forbes and, and and so that was but insisted on giving his evidence in russian that was quite helpful and and he couldn't have done that in a court hearing because you would have had to set everything up um I really would endorse at this point about it being a very intensive process. I, I do recommend you build in quite decent gaps um, and you don't really sit for more than three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon. That, that's long enough. On those days when we went longer, you could see that people were getting um, really tired. I think um, witness demeanor, I actually felt that we could see the witnesses very clearly and you could assess their demeanor. It was quite, you know, if the camera setup is right, and if your own witnesses do spend a lot of time thinking about where are the, when they look at the tribunal and the advocate in front, get that as close to the camera as possible so they're not doing this when they're giving their evidence. Think about the background, is it distracting? Get it, you know, make it look professional. Make sure they don't wear a stripy shirt. I, I made that mistake on one day and it was like I was at something out of a sci-fi movie about to be transported away doesn't work stripy shirts stripy ties don't work um uh, but but uh you know just really work through the, the the technical side of it but my my takeaway was it worked incredibly well um and i think it did result in significant savings for us because we didn't need a venue um the witnesses didn't need to fly over from russia we had somebody in the u.s loads of people in russia loads of people in london the tribunal dotted around in surrey it, was, it worked very well. Got a bit hot for the tribunal members because they didn't have air conditioning, which was very unfair. But we were okay. Do you think, I don't know if you've had that, but I know some of the tribunals now offer those, you know, hearing locations, which are fully, allegedly fully secured and where you can have a witness or you can have, you know, one of the party to be present there. Did you have that? And uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? Does that provide maybe some comfort to the parties that, you know, this is the way to avoid some of the issues that might come up in virtual hearings? I think it's the same, same approach that applies for any sort of deposition, if you like, remote deposition. You do need to be able to see that the witness is not being given signs in the room. So we, the way we dealt with that was to have a lawyer from each side sitting in, in the room, and that seemed to work pretty well. But you mentioned, Aksana, that there are dispute centers that are now setting up, which are so COVID secure, and you can, you can use that. Um, one other idea I've heard um, is having another camera in, in the room, you know, a second from, from behind the witness, for example. But perfectly, all these things you can get around. But again, that's something you've got to pre-agree in your protocol um, but before you do that. Let me put another, I think we have another poll which is on, on, the, on this topic and it says, should only the main witness come to physical court with the presumption being that minor witnesses give evidence remotely? And this is consistent with what you sometimes have hybrid hearings where you might just have the advocates and the tribunal in a room but and maybe your main witnesses the ones who are going to be in the box for a day or so but those people that are, you know may only speak for five minutes but fly over from wherever can you can you do both what do people think uh it's it's close <laughs> we have five people yes and four people no So why anyone, any of the no's willing to pop up and explain why you think that's not a good idea? 
No. So that's, I suppose it's, isn't, it may not give parity between the witnesses, perhaps. You know, if, again, if you don't have the safety concerns, uh, it's, it might still be a good idea. On the one hand, you know, it's a cost saving that you're not flying all those kind of minor witnesses. But at the same time, you do have your main witness there in person. And frankly, you know, I think one of the issues that I have with having my witness not there with me because, you know, when you sit in a deposition or in a hearing and you see the witness is getting tired or certainly needs a break, you can just say, hey, you know, your honor, can we just take a break or, you know, and sometimes the witness is like, I'm fine, I can go. I'm like, okay, well, I need a break. <laughs> so it's much easier to do that in person while your witness is somewhere across the world, you know, on your own video. So I think for my main witnesses to be there with them. I tell you one of the practical reasons why we didn't go for a, a hybrid hearing was that um, we were worried about well, what happens if one member there gets symptoms and everyone else suddenly has to self-isolate or worse still if everyone else gets infected in that way. And you think about the consequences for a long trial being adjourned because of something like that. Is that really worth risking? I mean, we, we took the firm view collectively with the other side, I think. It just wasn't worth risking. Um, when you yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree right now there are I think too many safety concerns since it makes sense to right to have fully virtual um, let's just see if we have anything else from the audience I think we have one more poll and in the meantime Alexi what are, are your thoughts on you know how to avoid the witnesses being coached or like what are the you know tips that you've observe that are helpful in virtual hearings uh, dealing with the witnesses? Uh, well, I think uh, we are not unique here because, the, of course, the, 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 pro probably one of the main concerns or fears is the coaching. And, uh, well, so far, I, actually, we applied very simple uh, technical things. So, uh, one, uh, ideally, yes, it's uh, for a uh, member of the firm just to come and see the witness. That's, that, that's the guarantee. But again, that may not be entirely safe uh, in, um, in, in the current circumstances. So the, uh, the uh, other way to deal with this is uh, just to use two cameras or uh, have, uh, have the witness uh, just show, basically uh, rotate your camera, show who else is in the room, who is, <laughs> who is uh, uh, giving signs. Uh, still, I think that's... Um, that's not uh, that's not perfect. That's that's not an absolute guarantee of the, of the integrity of the of the procedure. That, that's that's why uh, I, I still tend to think that uh, uh, for uh, high value disputes, uh, to the extent possible, f physical taking of evidence and physical hearings uh, might be better. Um, also, by the way, I think there is there is uh, uh, in addition to this possibility of coaching, there is. Uh, you should always, especially with the Russian disputes, just think through to the enforcement stage and think uh, what might be the problems, what might be the arguments uh, for, for setting aside and for opposing uh, the enforcement. And uh, there is a, it's uh, possible to argue uh, under New, New York Convention uh, and uh, under uh, many arbitration laws that uh, the award shouldn't be enforced uh, if there was an inequality of arms, if there was uh, a, an absence of uh, due process, uh, the party wasn't uh, given uh, given a chance to state its case, uh, there was some procedural unfairness. And again, uh, as, as a matter of principle, having those virtual hearings, uh, I can hardly really see uh, a, a plausible argument that just just by the, because those were, were hearing, uh, the hearings were virtual or part virtual hybrid, that's somehow a violation of uh, due process. It's 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 too um, it's a long shot. But uh, there might be circumstances where this is the case. So, for example, uh, especially if, if the parties are really in uh, an unequal situation on a technical. So, for example, one one party has is experienced, uh, has, uh, uh, has uh, procured very good uh, technical uh, services, it, it has good broadband, uh, everything runs smoothly, and uh, the other party struggles. 
so it, it doesn't have a, a good connection it's uh, it's uh, software just uh, uh, is faulty and uh, basically they simply cannot or uh, maybe it even works but later on when uh, they don't like the result they will say that they were uh, prevented from uh, really arguing their case and uh, there was uh, uh, absence of due process uh, apparently uh, uh, to this date uh, no awards have been uh, set aside or there were no at least there are no known cases where uh, there was a refusal to enforce the awards uh, because of the virtual hearings but we 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 have to see and this practice may develop and again i, I think on a very very fact specific basis so maybe uh, i don't buy into the proposition that just having the virtual hearing uh, is a, is a violation of due process as such but with under some circumstances like like those technical issues affecting the hearing they might be a, actually a good argument that's that, that there was a, such a violation so and and again that's that's uh, something that you need to consider when deciding if you, if you, if you agree to those hearings and, uh, there is no universal recipe here quickly as we come into an end there's uh, one more question from the audience about would it not be an unfair advantage to the main witness, I assume, uh, testifying in person? And from my personal experience, witnesses, would, I think the majority of witnesses, they would love to do uh, any testimony virtually. That's less disruption to their lives. I think it's more for the party and for you as a practitioner to determine, you know, strategy-wise, whether it's more beneficial. And I think sometimes it might depend on a witness, you know. Some witness, it might be beneficial for you to be present right there next to literally holding the witness's hand, you know. Um, it's different case, I think, with the expert witnesses. They, of, of course, are getting paid, so they don't mind, I think, traveling and everything. But otherwise, you know, other witnesses, especially minor witnesses, certainly would prefer um, to have as less disruption to their lives by the hearings. I mean, I'm wondering, Anna, I don't know whether we can allow you to, to speak or whether you would like to speak, but um, I was wondering, oh, look, I've just put you up, isn't that unfair? Whether you, as an interpreter, have um, seen examples of witnesses struggling with remote hearings, for example? Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, this summer I've done uh, an arbitration hearing with um, witnesses being actually summoned in um, in their office and a couple of them found it impossible to focus on both the face of the council and the voice of the interpreter or the face of the interpreter on the screen whereas in a normal setting they would be looking at the council, looking at the panel. Um, I think some of them struggled to sort of sense where the question was coming from, if you understand what I mean. I do. What about interruptions, he says, interrupting you? Uh, actually, there were few interruptions uh, on the remote hearing because everybody was, I guess, more sensitive and conscious about the technical difficulties of speaking at once. So from that point of view, I think this probably went smoother than sometimes it does in the actual hearing room. I'll tell you one thing that worked really, thank you, Anna, one thing that worked really well with us, which we thought would be a problem, is communicating with your lead advocate. You've probably all been in the position where you write a note on the post, it takes you a bit long to write it on a post, so you stick it on the back of your, your QC or whoever your advocate is, and they politely put it on the side of their desk and then never read it. What we had was we, we set up three layers. So the client, a WhatsApp chat room where the clients and the solicitors, um, the, you know, the non-advocates um, would exchange views and then somebody within that group would then feed that through to the, the barristers, the advocates, the junior counsel and the senior counsel. And then somebody from the junior counsel would then feed through the final polished point. And it could be something as simple as 
a trial bundle reference. Look, take the witness to this in re-examination or um, a problem with the transcript. And it was incredibly efficient to do it that way. But you have to filter it in that way. You can't have everybody, heaven forbid, the clients WhatsApping your, your QC or your leader or whoever it is. That worked quite well. Oh, one other thing I'll just mention, breakout rooms, virtual breakout rooms. Um, proceed with caution. I think my firm, unfortunately, was um, across all of the national newspapers for um, the comments made by one of our lawyers being broadcasted into the main courtroom in this big hearing in, in London. And it was all over the Daily Mail because the person commented on um, whether or not the witness is telling the truth. And so that was that was awful um, and unfortunate for, the, for, 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 for everyone. But it was a technical error. And we had something similar on mine where we were suddenly broadcasted into it. So we set up a separate Zoom link to, to, to take our client discussions elsewhere to be absolutely secure. I think as it's coming to an end, we've got our last poll. And um, would you favor other portions of the case, such as submissions also being held remotely? And the overwhelming majority said yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think we've got one or two minutes left. I'll, I'll, I'll just say a few words of thanks to our panel and to all of you for joining. I think the um, constraints imposed by COVID mean that it's remote hearings are here to stay. You can't currently plan on having an in-person hearing, I think, without a serious risk that something's going to intervene. Somebody will, will be unable to travel or, or, or be there. I think the big question is, you know, what about the future? And, and do we see, do we embrace this as an opportunity? Or is it something where we can default back to our old ways? And I think if we look at what some of the courts are doing, um, they are very much embracing this um, as a way forward for many different types of hearings, perhaps not the big trials. And so going back to the theme of this discussion, does it present an opportunity for arbitration over litigation? I'd say both litigators and arbitrators are asking themselves the same question from a level playing field. It's an opportunity for all, but if you don't grab it, I imagine you will get, as an option, you'll get left behind. Very good. Any any other comments or from people on the who kindly joined? Oh well, I'll just finish with a joke then. The um, I heard about a hearing in front of a very learned judge in the High Court in England where his cat walked across in front of his screen, which was fine. Everyone thought that was funny until the cat turned around to say hello to its owner. And unfortunately, with the webcam, everybody got anything that they really didn't want to have. So on that note, I will say, leave, lock your pets up as well before a remote hearing. And I'll end that there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.